Okay, why don't we get started? Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Arnold Weinfeld. I'm Associate Director at the MSU Institute for uh, Public Policy and Social Research. And welcome to today's Health Policy Issues Briefing. Uh, I want to, uh, of course, thank uh, our collaborator in this, the MSU Institute for Health Policy, as well as uh, the generosity of the Michigan Health Endowment Fund for their support of this program. Um, you, during today's session, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat. Uh, you should also be able to raise your hand and we'll unmute you to ask that question. Uh, I think I've got it. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to our partner, uh, Kathleen Stifler of the MSU Institute for Health Policy. Kathy. Thank you, Arnold, and welcome everyone. We're pleased um, to have this session for you today. It's probably one of the most important topics to be discussed in our state and one that doesn't often get the, the time and energy um, that it deserves. I am pleased um, to introduce two um, extremely dedicated professionals who have worked tirelessly um, to positively impact health outcomes. Um, Renee from a, a, a larger population, you know, the full life spectrum and Amy most recently on the maternal infant and child side, um, but to provide to assure that policies are providing opportunity for all people to fully um, thrive equally well together. And so today our session is gonna be talking about birth equity. Um, what we're hoping is we can get some energy around um, improving equity from the start. So I'm gonna start by introducing um, Amy Zagman. The, she's the executive director of the Michigan Council for Maternal and Child Health, which is an organization of diverse partners, um, hospital systems, statewide organizations, local public health partners um, who are working to address um, the um, improving outcomes for maternal, for mothers, um, infants, and children. And Dr. Renee Branch Can Kennedy, um, the CEO of the Michigan Public Health Institute. Um, many of you probably know Renee. Um, and just prior to joining MPHI, she was the health officer and director of the Ingham County Health Department. So I am going to turn it over to Amy. I will keep an eye on questions and we'll intersperse questions as we go. We'll also have an opportunity at the very end for any wrap up questions you might thought of um, after the, our two presenters speak today. So I will turn it over to Amy. Thanks, Kathy. Actually, I'm gonna take the baton first. Oh, and sorry. Yes. Um, that's quite all right. Um, I wanna thank you guys for prioritizing this dialogue and we do want it to be that. Amy and I are gonna share some content kind of focused content, but we hope that it really will be fodder for your thinking, um, both personally and professionally in your, in your roles. And um, I am a quote person, so I love, uh, I always like contextualizing remarks in quotes. And I wanted to share two of them with you. And one is an Old Testament quote. And it says, and this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. Infant mortality is not a new recent history type of event. We've been battling to keep babies alive uh, for a long time in the existence and history of mankind. And so we, we want you to see this as a problem, but we don't want you to see it as problematic. It is something that we can resolve and that we can address. And, and Amy and I both believe that or we would not be in this work. The other from the Spanish philosopher uh, says those, you, I'm sure it's a familiar quote, right? I never knew who spoke this quote, but those who don't know their history are destined to repeat it. And we are trying uh, desperately to keep from repeating history here. And so I do come to you as a 30-year public health professional, um, a former health officer, as Kathy said, um, but I also come to you as a mother who lost her first son when he was six months old due to the complications of his delivery at 28 weeks. And so, as I've said, we, we come to this to hopefully inform your thinking personally but also professionally. Um, and I also believe 
that some of the content that you will learn will also apply to lots of other areas, not just maternal child health, maternal uh, health and infant health, but really broadly, uh, because many of this is many of these points are a reflection of systems uh, and policy decisions that we make. Thank you, Renee. Um, I am going to there. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, try to advance the slides first and foremost. Um, uh, Kathy shared a little bit about me. I'm also going to tell you just a little bit more about the council um, and uh, let you know that uh, we've been around for almost 40 years. So we're not, not new to this work of trying to engage really in what it takes around policy um, to improve perinatal and children's health. Uh, maybe for anyone who isn't familiar with that word before we start throwing it around willy nilly, perinatal, sort of you think about the whole continuum, prenatal, um, what happens during the actual pregnancy and during birth, and then what happens in the postpartum period. So uh, simple word to think about all that time period is perinatal. Um, but our members really are engaged in providing those services um, in a variety of settings. And so that's really where we draw our uh, information from. And then um, really think about how we can collaboratively work with others um, to come up with potential um, policy solutions uh, to advance what you see here is the policy agenda, which I won't read through, but um, oftentimes people think of maternal and child health as being kind of a, uh, a narrow thing, and it's actually um, quite broad, as I've learned over the last dozen years that I've been with the council. Um, you may not have known, certainly with term limits, um, legislators and staff um, come and go. Um, I actually used to work in the legislature years ago um, and so have great appreciation for um, the time that you're spending here today and for any interest um, that you spend specifically on maternal and child health because even within the committee structure, uh, even knowing that you um, are uh, assigned to or dedicated to health issues, um, there is so much to work on. Um, that we're very grateful for your attention today and um, obviously interested in having any conversations that we can um, moving forward in any of these areas. So I just also want to maybe take a minute too to thank both of the institutes for this opportunity today. Um, I know uh, hopefully I saw that this is being recorded and hopefully if folks aren't able to join us today, they're able to watch it at some point in the future and like I said, engage in future conversations. I'll turn it back to Renee just to talk a little bit about MPHI. Oh yes, just a bit. Um, we are about half a decade younger than MCMCH. And um, I really like to describe um, MPHI as a clear, tangible demonstration of uh, governmental innovation. Uh, oftentimes people are critical of you know, the bureaucracy and the red tape and all of these challenges. Uh, but on the contrary, um, in the mid 80s, our elected officials, our legislature, along with the leadership of our state health department started thinking about how can we really bring some efficiency, um, greater effectiveness to how we care for the health and well-being of Michiganders. And so um, with uh, bipartisan consent, this organization, uh, the Michigan Public Health Institute was um, founded in 1989. And so we do refer to it as a unique public trust. It's a partnership between governmental and academic public health. So our board is half uh, governmental public health, both at the state and the local level. And the other half are, are what were the sort of big three universities at the time. So Michigan State, Wayne State, and the University of Michigan. And then there are a variety of other um, partners that come together in our work. And so we're set as a nonprofit, um, a neutral space for all of these parties to advance their own interests bring together their expertise. And um, having served there now for eight years, um, I always say it was the hardest decision that I ever made leaving uh, my health officer appointment at Ingham County. I love being a health officer, uh, but it has been a wonderful marriage. And you see there um, our mission and our vision uh, and our core values, all which are driven around working together in partnership with others to advance health.
you can flip to the next slide and we'll just go on to talk a little bit more about our content for um, today. So, you know, why focus on this thing called birth equity? Um, and when we think about equity, I, I just wanna make sure that you're differentiating that term from the term equality. These are not synonyms, right? Equity is about um, meeting women at the point of their unique needs, which may not be the same needs as some other community, some other region, but how are we honoring those things so that we make sure women, families, communities, birthing people have what they need um, to have a healthy um, uh, delivery. So every year about 25 women in Michigan die from complications related to pregnancy or childbirth. Um, you would just think that in this time and age, pregnancy and delivery would not be a threat to the health of women. And we submit that it happens far too often. So 25 women each year in this state alone. For every woman who dies, however, and I think this is especially important, we have about a hundred others that experience what we call a near miss. So they suffer some other type of severe life-threatening uh, life threatening injury. And we're expecting that that is about uh, 2,500 per year um, in that category. We still have work to do in Michigan. Our uh, infant mortality rate is 6.4%. Uh, the national average is 5.6%. Um, and we do continue to see that there are disparities across race, that Black women, Native American women, especially in our state, um, but also other women of color are more greatly and more disproportionately represented um, in those statistics. And so um, I, I submit, again, my case as a highly educated, well-resourced, socially supported mom that had that same experience. And so thinking about how much more um, might there be threats to the well-being of moms who don't have all of those resources that I have? So if we think about birth equity, we want you to see that as a noun. And the definition, I'm going to just read it so it, be, it will be real clear. Birth equity is the assurance of conditions of optimal births for all people with a willingness to address racial and social inequality in a sustained effort. And so we're not going to shy away from the uncomfortable conversation of race, racism, class, classism, because we know those things are impacting our responsibility to assure the conditions for good health. And we also, I really want to underscore this term, sustained effort. One of the challenges that we experience in public health, I would submit, is that we'll have a win and then sometimes we move on to the next thing. And so that lack of vigilance and sustained effort finds us coming right back around to the same problem in another half a decade or decade or longer than that. And so we really wanna underscore that birth equity is about sustaining the effort. The things that we did to improve numbers are the things that we have to do to sustain those improved numbers. Thank you, Renee. I'm gonna um, flip through a few slides, go a little fast, hopefully don't make anyone dizzy, but I wanna, I do wanna just sort of level set with some of the data that um, uh, was not produced by the Council for Maternal and Child Health. Um, uh, you'll see there's there should be sources on most of these and, um, but they're produced by the Department of Health and Human Services and a very dedicated uh, epidemiological staff um, who, um, can slice and dice this data however you would like, but I pulled a few slides just to sort of um, get everyone caught up to speed. In most cases, this is the most recent data that's available. Um, you'll see there's always usually a lag time of a year or two um, in the data so that um, uh, we, you know, are not always operating off the most current, but certainly um, we're operating um, off the data that we have. So uh, this is a, um, you know, a, a decade retrospective on the infant mortality rate in Michigan. Um, you can see um, uh, that the number of live births um, has 
uh, dropped. Um, we, we do have a declining birth rate in the state of Michigan, a really pretty slow decline. Um, and so the infant mortality rate is a function of the number of infant deaths over the number of live births. And so while the number of infant deaths has declined, um, it um, is still at 6.4% of the number of live births. And we are making progress per se, um, but you'll also see that if you really just look at this chart and you look across it, we're pretty, pretty flat, pretty plateaued. Um, and so, um, you know, this is, this is the challenge um, as we look forward is really to say, um, how can we get Michigan down to the national average and how can we get Michigan down to what is largely considered sort of the natural infant mortality rate. Um, I don't know, certainly not in my lifetime, will we ever get to a point where we don't, don't lose infants. Um, uh, there are congenital, congenital abnormalities and other issues um, that make it um, pretty impossible, I think, for us to ever get to a point where we don't have um, infant mortality. Um, but uh, we certainly can make progress on this number. Um, the other, really, this is the story that we want to emphasize when we talk about um, strategies around birth equity. This is, this is really the important slide, is to think about the fact that the number um, uh, for, the, the blue number is uh, the number for white infants um, in, in the state of Michigan. The gray is the average. Um, the orange line is the number for, for black infants. Or I'm sorry, the gray line is Hispanic. Can you follow my own key? Um, the number for, for the orange line is the number of, of black non-Hispanic infants and the yellow line is the disparity. So if you look at the, in, the disparity between black and white infants, um, you'll see um, that this number actually is trending in the wrong direction. So we've been going so that the disparity is increasing. So we're seeing the number for um, white um, non-Hispanic infants dropping, um, you know, pretty plateaued, but dropping slightly in the number for black non-Hispanic infants um, has been um, rising over the last couple of years. So this is what the focus is now. This is the focus really is to think about um, how do we, how do we, um, our, the goal of, of everyone I know is, is to take this disparity down to zero. Obviously we'd like to take infant mortality down to zero, um, but this disparity is really, this focus of the attention around birth equity. If I can just throw in one point on that slide, yeah. um, if y'all notice that the uh, we've got good news in that white infant mortality is declining. That is a good thing. It also is the thing that's expanding the disparity because as white infant mortality is improving, black and Hispanic infant mortality are, um, are getting worse. And so it is all about that relationship. And I'll also just throw out that we talk about the black white disparity as opposed to the white Hispanic disparity because we're sort of looking at who's performing best as a population and who's perform performing worse as a population. So just a couple of other sidebars for you to think about. Yeah, this is probably also a good point for me to make that you don't see a line on this chart um, for the Native American population. I think Renee already mentioned, and certainly we'll talk about it more when we talk about um, a regional focus, um, but if there were a line on here, it would be very close um, uh, to the Black non-Hispanic number. So um, where there is enough data um, by region and by county to um, produce that data, uh, the disparity would be um, significant um, and the infant mortality rate among that population is significant in the state. Um, and the, the reason you don't see it here is uh, there's not enough data um, for it to be um, just available on this chart specifically. Um, the, we just talked about infant mortality. So the number of infants that, that die based on the number of live births. Um, this is actually um, talking about maternal mortality and Renee talked about um, the number of women that are lost um, during uh, pregnancy or in the immediate postpartum period. So this is pregnancy associated maternal mortality and there's pregnancy associated and pregnancy related. Um, pregnancy associated means it can be directly related to the pregnancy 
or in the year following delivery. And so uh, this is the wider measure of the two. Um, pregnancy related would be directly related to or aggravated by the pregnancy. So think of those as being more likely to be a medical condition, um, something that's directly attributable to the physiological changes of pregnancy. So um, again, um, what we're really focused on here is, um, I'll tell you two things I think that we're focused on. If you look back over a decade worth of data, you can see um, that the numbers were really um, disparate in 2017, came closer together in 2000, or 2007, I apologize, 2008. We were closer together with regard to the black-white um, disparity. But I'll also note that, that this trend line, um, even for white women, is increasing. Um, and we know that the trend line has been um, increasing. It bumps around a little bit um, for Black non-Hispanic. But this is a national conversation, a national interest about why um, we, as one of the highest income countries in the world, um, continue to see an increase in our maternal mortality. And so um, absolutely, there's a conversation about maternal mortality in general. And again, the conversation is really about what are we doing uh, to address this disparity? Um, and many of the strategies that we want to share with you um, are specifically coming um, to talk about what we're doing uh, about Black maternal mortality and Black, black maternal health. Um, so I, I just wanted to, sorry, I don't know why my Mouse is so jumpy. I don't mean to give everyone anyone uh, whiplash there. Um, there's a couple of slides here. So I think the natural next question is, do we know? Do we know why babies die? And I think I already mentioned that there's a certain amount of infant mortality that likely um, will exist um, until uh, we get to the point where we have um, uh, medical answers for um, every um, congenital anomaly and uh, every premature condition. But this is a uh, five-year look back on the number and percent of deaths. So if you think of the percents as uh, equaling 100, it gives you an idea on the proportion. And again, the number, you'll see the number over the course of this time uh, did go down. Um, again, sort of corresponding to the reduced birth rate. But what you'll notice, I think there's some trends here to look at and prematurity pretty constant. So um, interestingly, um, you know, we know that prematurity is the number one cause of infant death. Um, and so a lot of focus really around what are the drivers of premature birth. Um, congenital anom anomalies, um, the number has actually dropped. And so, uh, you know, that I think uh, is largely indicative of some of the um, prenatal testing that can happen and prenatal procedures um, that can happen. So there's lots of advances that have been made about um, uh, surgery in utero and those type of things. A very concerning issue, um, Renee already talked about um, as old as the Bible is this issue of um, infants that die um, in their sleep. Um, uh, and you know, there's lots of reasons, um, but the, the largest is um, you know, a compromised sleep position. So, um, and, and I meant to say there's lots of reasons for the compromising. Compromised sleep position is um, almost always involved um, with what folks in you know, normal culture think of as SIDS. Um, there's obviously other um, smaller percentage-wise reasons listed here. Um, there's been some improvement around infections and improvement around obstetric conditions. We aren't going to spend a lot of time here today because I don't have the clinical expertise. I don't know if Renee wants to, um, about some of the advances that have been made um, in the clinical field in these areas and continue to be made really to make sure that um, in the clinical setting, um, there's as much um, response and skill set available so that we don't have um, babies die um, because of things like infections or uh, other causes that are medical in nature. So the, the, the um, tandem side of this is, do we know why women die in the perinatal period? And we do. Um, uh, I'm going to talk in a minute about these data sources and how rich they are. But in Michigan, you can see, um, again, this is separated out by pregnancy related versus pregnancy associated. So again, you'll note that these pregnancy related causes really are medical in nature. They're specific to um, the fact that the woman was pregnant at the time. And these are the causes. Um, 
down at the bottom, you'll know hemorrhage, infection, and cardiomyopathy, um, combined with a couple of other conditions here, cardiovascular issues um, are um, one of the leading causes of pregnancy-related deaths. Pregnancy associated is, you know, within the year following, following birth. And so what's found is that these conditions existed partially because of the pregnancy or that it was just within one year following the pregnancy. And so sometimes it's difficult to know. Um, I'd give you an example and not um, to, to say that this is the only situation, but you'll note that homicide is at 18%. Um, and we do know uh, that things like um, domestic violence and abuse uh, can escalate um, and are documented to escalate during pregnancy. So um, certainly um, that's why these things are listed as factors for pregnancy associated injury deaths. I wanted to um, just again give credit where credit is due. So I didn't create these charts, um, you know, most of them were borrowed from the Department of Health and Human Services, and they are built off of um, extensive processes that exist to gather really valuable data. And so um, a lot of information is available on birth and death certificates. You know, those questions are asked for a reason. That data is incredibly helpful um, uh, to, to, fill, to fill out um, information that we may need about births and deaths, but there's more to it really. And so Michigan has two processes, uh, the maternal mortality surveillance and the fetal infant mortality review, which give us much more granular data about what was happening. Uh, in the case of the maternal mortality surveillance, um, teams of experts, um, providers and community members, um, they go through individual cases where a woman has died and look at the circumstances surrounding her death. Um, so they're looking at medical review, they're looking at um, all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, situ uh, determinants of health um, kind of information and categorizing um, her death so that it can make up the chart that you just saw. And fetal infant mortality review, these are local teams. They don't exist in every part of the state, but I've listed here the counties that do uh, fetal infant mortality review. And these are local teams of diverse stakeholders. So uh, again, you can see the types of folks, everything from clinicians to faith-based organizations, law enforcement. Um, these are um, teams that come together and they look at cases where there's been um, a, a fetal loss. So this would be after 24 weeks. Um, or an infant loss in their area, and they're making the same types of very detailed findings um, so that collectively um, they can also make recommendations about um, what might have prevented those poor outcomes, and those recommendations can be combined with other fetal infant mortality review um, and, and help guide um, things like policy. And the last one I'll mention is PRAMS. Um, I don't think I used any PRAMS data per se, but um, I did um, provide in the resource listing that you have um, the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System link. This is an extensive questionnaire, so it is incredibly helpful. Um, it has a lot of rich context. It's uh, a survey that's done with um, uh, thousands of women in Michigan um, um, within six months after giving birth, and there are questions about their attitudes and experiences before, during, and after their pregnancy. And so um, it has very rich data. Um, the, the granularity of the questions can be incredibly helpful when you're thinking about policy. Um, I would just point out that, um, uh, I'll give you an example, just so, you're, so you can think about how it, it uh, relates to my advocacy work and how it could relate to your legislative work. Um, there's a question in PRAMS that talks about um, employment during pregnancy. And one of the questions is about whether the woman um, had her employment status changed um, during her pregnancy or immediately postpartum and whether that choice was voluntary on her part. So basically we're asking, were you fired or were your hours reduced? Um, and, and that's important for us to know, right? And I think we inherently know, and there's certainly documented evidence of discrimination, um, job discrimination for pregnant women, but that kind of information tells us that that is happening in Michigan and to what degree. And that is very helpful 
um, to in policy conversations about things like Medicaid work requirements um, and things like postpartum extension. We're going to talk in just a minute about the moves that um, you all have made to extend po Medicaid postpartum coverage in Michigan. And I think it's very helpful to understand um, the socioeconomic context for um, pregnant and postpartum women who um, may have been part of the workforce and had that um, situation disrupted um, through no fault of theirs, through, through no choice of theirs. So that's the type of information. That's one question. There are dozens of questions. Um, they you know, run the gamut from um, all kinds of information about what was happening um, prior to pregnancy, um, and, every, and anything from um, breastfeeding attitudes and length of breastfeeding to um, uh, unmet basic needs, that information is all incredibly useful for us to understand the complexity of why we um, need to change policy if we hope to make any advances in infant and maternal mortality. So I just wanted to point those out. In many cases, I have um, linked those in the resources. And I just want to say that um, you know, I don't think we can underestimate these systems that exist to give us rich data, and they, they're really um, something that needs to be utilized, I think, at every point, because if we don't listen to the data in combination with communities, um, I think we often miss the mark. So I'm going to turn it over to Renee. She's going to talk a little bit about some of that work that's going on in community. Yeah, thank you, uh, Amy. Man, those statistics just make my head spin every time. Um, but we, I am really proud to live in a state that is actively and intentionally engaging communities in the solutions to the problems that we're facing. So um, our state health department has been um, very uh, intentional about shifting the frame in their sort of strategic plan um, from kind of just reporting data to really thinking about how are we using data to resolve problems. And Amy and I have been privileged to share a couple of little work groups that have been a part of this process. Um, but the Mother Infant Health and Equity Improvement Plan, I think is a really um, important strategy for our state. And, and I will um, offer that there was an initial um, uh, draft that was submitted and community had some reactions and thoughts to it. And I'm really proud that our state leaders said, well, we're going to pull that back in and we're going to make some adjustments and revisions and resubmit it based on that, that impact, so, uh, that impact from um, communities. So there are sort of three um, key objectives that we're trying to address in this plan. And that is for us to explicitly address disparities for us to align public and private sector work, we're all in this together, for us to integrate interventions across the maternal infant dyad. Um, and you know, let me just tell you one little thing that was shifted on the report. The cover had um, a picture of beautiful babies, just the cutest little things. Um, different races, different gender, seemingly all appropriate, but they were all sitting on a bed. And our safe sleep um, community members said, no, this is not the message that we want to go out. And so it's attention to that level of detail that's been really um, tantamount in the way we've done the work here. Um, in addition to pulling work groups together and communities together and drafting this plan, um, we also have had an annual summit that MDHHS has coordinated and sponsored that brings together professionals to really talk about best practices. And we have really been able to bring in some heavy hitters from across our nation, um, everything from scientists and physicians like Dr. Joy Creer Perry uh, from New Orleans, who leads the um, National Birth Equity Collaborative, to um, a father who lost his wife during um, childbirth, uh, Mr. Charles Johnson, who's, um, who um, translated that loss into really a passion and a movement. And he is now very well known across the nation, advancing what he calls Kira's project named in honor of his wife. And so very, very strong um, 
speakers to help us think differently about our work in, in Michigan. Um, as Amy mentioned, we have communities that are engaging and hosting regional perinatal, perinatal quality improvement collaboratives. The importance of that is that, as she said, no single collaborative looks alike. They are focused on what are the regional needs, the needs of the UP, we know are very different than the needs of, uh, say, mid-Michigan, the Lansing area, or the needs of Southeast Michigan. And so, again, equipping communities to lead up and to push through to our state leadership what those particular needs are have been uh, really, really important. Uh, you've got a link there that will take you to um, uh, one of where all of the regional perinatal collaboratives can be found. And I certainly encourage you to, um, to think about those and take advantage of them. We have um, nine of these collaboratives um, that are in operation. Six of them have focused on equity based on racial disparities in their area. I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the partnering work with um, at M MPHI. And we have over 30, I think it was about 33 when I counted them, projects on maternal child health that we uh, partner with. You know, part of our vision says working with you to promote health and, and well being. And so none of this is work that MPHI said, let's just go do this. Most of it is work that federal, state, and local partners have said, hey, can you help us? Can you use your capacity and your ability to help us in this space? Some of the work, um, I often say that we do national work because it makes our Michigan work stronger. We get to go out, spy the land, and bring in insights to Michigan. And other times, federal folk and national folk are calling us saying, hey, you guys are really getting this right in Michigan. Can you help us in Utah or in Indiana, which are a couple of places where some of our maternal child health work is. Um, I'm real proud that we serve as the National Center for Prevention Initiatives for HRSA. So that's a federal initiative where um, child death review and FEMR work is um, uh, based. Um, Amy mentioned, talk to you a little bit about FEMR. Child death review is a similar type of model. It has a, a longer age span for the children that are reviewed really anywhere from up to 17 years of age, where if there was an accidental unintentional death, really any death that this community, including education, law enforcement, social work, public health, healthcare, it's a cross-sector collaborative that comes to look at what caused the death of that youth so we can learn from that and prevent it in the future, which is the same goal as uh, FEMA reviews. Um, at the state level, we um, house kind of a, a center on home visiting uh, capacity building, I guess I'll say. There are lots of different models of home visiting, um, lots of evidence-based models. Parents as teachers is one, nurse family partnership is another. There are several of them. And in this center at MPHI, we support um, professional development, quality improvement, capacity building for those professionals in that space, helping them advance a high, um, high quality service, as you know, going into the homes of moms and families. Uh, another state initiative, which we are um, really proud to have brought together as really just sort of a think tank, thinking about you know, what is that, um, the, if we could take this indignation about moms dying and really push it into something that would help us change systems, what would that be? And that became what we called ABES, Achieving Birth Equity Through Systems Change. We got together our best ideas. We went to a very important funder in our state, the Michigan Health Endowment Fund, and they were interested in partnering with us. And so this has been a space, you know, I always like to say, um, you know, you, uh, uh, you don't know, a fish doesn't know it's wet until it's out of the fishbowl. Some of these inequities were happening all around us and you just don't think about them. And so this initiative was taking leaders, um, 
health systems, um, presidents, VPs, all types of different director level folk to say, hey, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. You're a leader and doing the work now is very different from doing the work um, in the past. And so we did some um, training, some workshops, some dialoguing um, to help them think about how they should do their work differently, how they should lead their organizations differently. And then just a couple of examples at the local level, we're really honored um, to have um, gained and maintained the trust of our colleagues in the Intertribal Council of Michigan. Uh, Amy has mentioned that this odd mathematical thing, right, that we know Native American babies are dying, but somehow or another the statistics and the math don't put them on the, the chart, right? And so with this work, we begin saying, well, regardless of what happens mathematically in two by two tables, what are we gonna do about the fact that we're looking at this family that has ha experienced an infant death? And so working closely with the Intertribal Council of Michigan, helping them write grants, helping them um, draft reports to um, really sort of build the narrative of what they're experiencing in the various tribes in Michigan. And at the local level, I will say my own uh, biases are showing here. I just, we also partner with Ingham County's uh, he, uh, Healthy Start, not Head Start, that's a typo, Strong Start Healthy Start initiative where um, they are, again, working with infants up to three years of age to get them ready for school, get them ready for pre-K. Parenting is not intuitive. When you were raised in a healthy, strong, well-equipped home, then you sort of think parenting is like, well, yeah, doesn't everybody know how to do that? But there are a lot of families that need support and are seeking education on how to best um, support their, their young ch children. So those are just a couple of the um, activities that we have happening um, in this, at MPHI. Thank you, Renee. Um, I wanted to just give nod to the fact that um, the legislature has really been an active participant always in infant maternal health, but in the last couple of years, um, there's been good agreement around making, especially investments in the state budget, um, the Healthy Moms, Healthy Babies initiative um, that was uh, in the current year budget, um, the current year that's just about to end, um, ex put funding in place to extend Medicaid um, coverage to 12 months postpartum, um, expanded behavioral health supports for pregnant and postpartum women, and made um, some critical investments to expand home visiting services. Uh, Renee talked about the importance of home visiting, um, of matching a trained professional with a pregnant or, or new family. Um, and uh, Michigan has a rich history in home visiting, um, but we also need to really invest in making sure that families can find um, home visiting models in their area and that they're matched with the model of their choosing um, that matches the goals that they have um, uh, for their their uh, their child and their parenting ability. So um, uh, definitely um, excited and have been a big part, big proponent of home visiting for some time. Um, and so we're, we're excited about that. Um, I'll just point out that um, the Medicaid postpartum extension is included in the FY22 budget agreement. In fact, all of these things are continued in the FY22 agreement that um, we hope to see the governor sign this week. Um, and um, the one thing that, that would make Senate, um, the postpartum extension um, more permanent would be to move a statutory bill. Um, Senator Winnie Brinks has a bill introduced, Senate Bill 252, and we'd um, definitely like to see uh, the legislature consider moving that. Um, it would you know, put the um, postpartum extension in the Social Welfare Act and um, give it some degree of permanency um, as the um, Medical Services Administration, Medicaid agency looks to put the pieces in place so that we can assure we have postpartum extension um, as we come out of the COVID emergency that currently has allowed for um, postpartum coverage for, for women on Medicaid. No one has um, who was enrolled in Medicaid as of March 18th, 2020 has been 
um, disenrolled from the program. And so in that way, we have experienced postpartum extension in Michigan. We want to make sure we keep it. And we're grateful for the uh, legislature's commitment um, through the current year and, and FY22 budget agreement. Um, I also think I just would be remiss to point out that there's tremendous potential um, to invest in systems. And one of those, um, I think, is uh, on the precipice. Um, at the federal level, there's been a series of bills introduced. Um, they're called the Momnibus. There's 12 bills introduced by the, the Congressional Black Caucus, um, really trying to highlight um, strategies that they believe, if invested in, um, would, would uh, impact the disparities in the Black-White um, infant and maternal mortality rates. And so um, those bills have been incorporated and are part of the discussion right now in um, President Biden's uh, infrastructure package. And so uh, we're watching with great interest um, on what might be coming um, that the state could potentially capitalize on um, with regard to um, the mountain of us. So I, I did provide a link in the resources um, and there's lots of information out about the Momnibus. If you Google Momnibus, you'll probably be amazed at the amount and what well, the depth and um, breadth of the information that's available. Um, but I do think that um, we are, may see an opportunity in Michigan to get additional grant funding to fund um, things that are working here or things that we want to um, try which is a very nice segue to tell you about something we've been doing specifically um, through um, MCMCH. Um, we've been working with funding from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, um, trying to uh, lift up strategies in Michigan um, that are showing and uh, potential to impact the health inequities for Black and Indigenous women and babies. So um, we've been producing a series of what are called knowledge briefs, um, issue briefs and delving into um, very specific topics in the maternal and infant space. And then also um, the council has been providing some policy recommendations to go along with each of these areas. And so um, there's a link in your resources. Um, we've published to date pieces on doulas, on um, perinatal care, on um, the importance of maternal and infant mental health, and also the need to diversify the workforce um, that, that works with um, pregnant individuals and babies. Um, we have in progress four more. So this is a series that we intend to complete. Um, and so we just recently finished one around payment reform, which sounds boring, but I trust um, that you all will still read it. And we enjoyed working on it because how you pay for things, I think everyone who works in healthcare in any way, shape or form understands that the way in which healthcare is financed often um, uh, you know, predicts um, the way in which services are delivered and can in many ways impact outcomes. So uh, we're, we're finishing up a piece on payment reform that we hope to publish soon. And we will be um, working um, in collaboration with community partners. I should stress again that all of these have been um, informed by community partners, but we'll be working on a piece around breastfeeding. Um, and we'll also you, um, produce one by probably early next year on substance use and perinatal interventions and um, wrap up our series um, early next year with a piece around home visiting. As I think I've already mentioned how important we think home visiting is to, um, and the potential it holds to improve outcomes. I'm gonna go through quickly, cause I really would like to leave a little bit of time for dialogue and questions, um, just to highlight a couple of the things that we found in these um, knowledge products that we have produced already. So, um, uh, Again, um, I linked these in your um, resources and it is our intention to also deliver them um, to legislative offices so that you'll have a hard copy. Um, but we did a piece on doulas um, and really tried as much as possible to talk to doulas around the state of Michigan um, about their experience. So if you're not familiar um, with what a doula is, um, this is probably a great example of where um, what's old is new again um, or what has been um, around forever, um, has been rediscovered. And doulas are really seeing a rebirth in popularity um, as pregnant and postpartum women and their families are looking for emotional and, and physical support and services um, to really help them navigate um, uh, their, their pregnancy and their birth. Um, and specifically, um, 
we've tried to lift up programs that are community based um, and doulas who um, serve their own community as there is great evidence to show that it can reduce um, racial disparities in birth outcomes. So um, all of the information, uh, you know, more than you probably um, wanted to know is uh, available through the resources in the brief. And I think the brief gives um, a good synopsis of some working programs in the state of Michigan and the potential that exists around doulas. So two things I would just point out from a legislative perspective is um, Senator Geis has a bill introduced um, to require coverage of doulas under the state's Medicaid program, of which we are very supportive. And it also um, really needs a complementary bill um, that would require all insurers to cover doulas. There are some private insurance, com insurance companies which will provide some reimbursement for doulas, but without some sort of um, coverage for doulas built into insurance coverage, um, I think it's um, you know, unreasonable to assume that people would be able to always afford to pay for a doula out of pocket. And so insurance reimbursement, both Medicaid and private um, are a couple of things pointed out here. Um, the other policy recommendations that we make um, are focused more at sort of thinking about how to um, embed doulas in other parts of the system. So making sure things like hospital policies don't restrict doulas from participating in a birth and care team. Um, so that's um, a little bit about doulas. Um, the perinatal care brief that we published um, uh, really asks the question and lifts up some alternative metals, methods of perinatal care. So if you think about the standard OB visits, so if you've been pregnant or had a family member who's pregnant, you're probably familiar with the fact that there's a long established set of visit frequency to um, an obstetrics provider. And really asking the question, does that fit? Um, is that really uh, maximizing outcomes for everyone? And so there um, are alternative models of perinatal care. Um, we lift up three of them in the brief. We talk about freestanding birth centers. Um, we talk about, and, and freestanding birth centers, uh, we, we lift up an example um, called Birth Detroit that's in the city of Detroit uh, and offers, um, uh, Sort of a holistic approach um, to caring for um, pregnant and postpartum women. And we also um, lift up Centering Pregnancy, which is a group-based perinatal care model um, where women um, who are at similar points in their pregnancy um, are in a group-based setting. Um, they also receive individual attention from an obstetrics provider, but they do some basic educational sessions and certainly have the emotional support of their group um, through centering pregnancy. Um, and the third model that we lifted up um, really was very timely because of COVID, but was actually under um, development prior to COVID. Um, it's called, I'm going to stay home, stay connected. I always get the name wrong, so I wanted to make sure I got it right. Stay home, stay connected, which was created by the University of Michigan. Um, it's a it's a model that uses partially virtual um, visits in, in addition to a limited number of in-person visits. And they were able to um, you know, quickly pivot um, during COVID and offer that um, to their patients, which gave them some real-time uh, information about how it worked to improve outcomes, certainly worked to keep people um, in a safer setting than bringing them into um, the hospital or the clinic um, where they may have been um, you know, more likely to be exposed. So um, we lift those things up and in it, we talk about some of the policy findings that would um, make putting those, those uh, alternative um, models in place more uh, functional.